Those of you already in London know that this is University College Hospital, one of the best hospitals in the UK. And everyone who's a UK resident can get treatment there free at the point of use. That's because in the UK, basic healthcare is not provided by the marketplace. It is provided publicly by the government. Everybody can be treated by the NHS and it is paid for by insurance contributions, basically a form of tax. Maybe if you're a student or international visitor, you have to purchase health insurance. But basically everyone who's a resident gets, um, gets treatment for free. Other countries like Germany, for example, do have a health insurance marketplace, but it is so heavily regulated um, that it basically resembles a public option. Uh, it is mandatory to purchase health insurance. Health insurance provider, providers cannot turn away uh, customers, potential applicants for things like pre-existing conditions or anything really. Um, and the price, so the basic level of premiums is set by the government and income dependent. In other countries, however, like in the United States, health insurance, uh, of course, is provided by the marketplace. Um, and what we need to look at now is we have to work through uh, how this works in the light of adverse selection. To understand health insurance markets, we need a little more terminology. The first term here is risk aversion. Most people are relatively risk averse. So, if I offer you a gamble, uh, a, a game, uh, and I say, look, I'm going to offer you £400,000, uh, no question asked, or you can play. We will flip a, a coin uh, and the coin toss will decide whether you win a million pounds or whether you end up £200,000 uh, in debt. What would you choose? Would you choose the 400000 with certainty? Or would you choose the gamble? Would you flip a coin to either win a million or lose 200,000 pounds, which you may or may not have? What would you choose? I'm sure most of you would choose the 400,000 pounds with certainty because you're trying to avoid the big loss. Um, if that's the case, you're risk averse. Hmm? Uh, many of you would even choose a smaller amount than, than 400,000 pounds, say 200,000, even half, Many of you would, would still choose that over the gamble, over the, over the risk. Mm -hmm. um, so most people are very risk averse when it comes to large sums. We all enjoy maybe a little gamble or betting or something like this with smaller sums uh, and maybe risk loving in these domains, but with large sums, we tend to be risk averse. The second term is actuarially fair insurance. It's a mouthful actuarially fair insurance. I can barely say it. Um, basically, actuarially fair insurance is fair insurance that just takes the value of the of the gamble, so to say, and converts it into, into a premium. Hmm. Let's say you have a one in five chance of losing a week of work uh, in the next year uh, uh, due to illness or something. Hmm. And if you're sort of a gig worker, say, um, this will cost you, of course, in terms of earnings. So if you drive an Uber or work in a, in a, in a place where you only get paid uh, for the hours that you actually work. And let's say it will cost you 500 pounds in lost, uh, lost earnings. Hmm. How much would it cost to insure against this risk? So what kind of offer should I, should I make to you as, a, as an insurance provider, say, to insure against this chance that you, you get ill for a week? Uh, and can't work. Well, the premium should basically be given by the probability of the loss occurring times the size of the loss. So the size of the loss, the lost earnings in this case is 500 pounds. The probability of this occurring is one in five. And so the, the premium of the actuarially fair insurance would be 100 pounds. So you should be willing to pay 100 pounds in order to avoid the risk the risk of um, of uh, falling ill and 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 losing the losing the uh, 500 pounds worth of earnings. Everyone see this? So basically, actuarially fair insurance is a way to convert these risks, these probabilities of losses, into sort of a constant uh, constant payment. If the insurance company were to charge more than 100 pounds for this for this specific insurance, it wouldn't be actuarially fair. It would be too much in a way. Um, 
Risk averse individuals will buy actuarially fair insurance to smooth out consumptions and, and, and avoid sort of the, the risk of these larger losses. So a risk averse individual would buy this actuarially fair insurance. But of course, as the insurance becomes less fair due to administration costs or co-pays, uh, etc., even risk averse individuals will be less and less likely to buy insurance. What is insurance? Insurance is a device for risk sharing, um, and it works via pooling, by combining the risks of many people. And what kicks in here is what is called the law of large numbers. And you will encounter this in your quant methods class as well, I think. Um, basically, it's this. Individually, you face uncertainty. Hmm? I face uncertainty. I don't know whether I will, I don't know. Go, get cancer next year. I hope not. Mm -hmm. But I have no idea, of course, whether this has happened. But taking as a group or a large group, people, all people in the UK of my age, we can calculate quite precisely the proportion of people that will get cancer next year. But of course, if you are individually the one who will get it, we don't know. So uncertainty on the individual level, but very high certainty, very sort of good easily estimable uh, probability on the on the group level. And this basically allows for gains from trade. So we can all pool our uh, resources together and basically insure against some of these risks. So pooling of risks due to the law of large numbers is the key to insurance markets. And insurance markets exist for many things. Hmm? Uh, there's car insurance, there's sort of additional health insurance, even in places that have uh, that have public health care systems. Some people insure their iPhones, you know, people insure the stuff in their house, their bikes, lots of things. But people are not very good at this. Um, there are some problems with the insurance markets. There's often over or under consumption. So some people are notoriously sort of over insured. They buy insurance for all sorts of uh, vagaries that they, that they think they might face. And other people miss out on really important, crucial sort of insurance. Um, there's, of course, also what economists you know, casually call the budget constraint. Huh? Some people don't have the money to buy insurance. They are too poor to buy insurance for certain things. Um, and we as humans, of course, are not very good at calculating risks and these kind of things. So we tend to discount the future too much. Huh? People underinvest into, into um, retirement, for example, without uh, some nudges and some some tricks of behavioral economics. Huh? People tend to underinvest into their into their pensions, for example, um, and sort of underestimate how much they will value this future consumption. Um, and humans are also notoriously bad at evaluating probabilities. Huh? Uh, that's why we have to teach it in university. Mm -hmm. So while insurance markets exist and work well for many risks, there are some issues with individual choice in this regard. That being said, there's no fundamental problem with sort of health insurance, for example, from the demand side. So let's look at the supply side a little bit and think about sort of uh, this, starting with this idea of actuarially fair insurance. So let's say the insurance provider offers a premium for individual I. What's this premium going to look like? What are the components here? Well, um, there's the probability that the event occurs, the probability that something happens, that somebody has a car accident or that gets ill or whatever it is. So P is the probability. This is, this is individually, of course, an individual's probability, which is can be estimated based on data from everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, insurance companies know how many car accidents occur every year. And insurance companies also know how many people get cancer, etc. Okay. And this is this is multiplied with the size of the loss. Mm -hmm. How costly is this car accident? For example, if you if you think about the value of the of, of your car, and then it is multiplied uh, with uh, with something that is a bit more than one because there are transaction costs and the insurance has to you know pay for the bureaucracy, etc. So actuarially fair insurance in the sort of purest form, of course, cannot exist because somebody has to provide it. Huh? Somebody has to set up the bureaucracy to actually provide this. So it's always going to be a bit more expensive than that. And so for uh, individuals, we have a premium that basically depends on the probability of the event occurring and the size of the loss. But for 
insurance markets to be competitive and efficient, uh, certain conditions have to hold. So we have these individual probabilities, pro PI, huh? individual probability of the loss occurring. These have to be independent. They have to be uncorrelated with each other. Hmm? Um, so, and that's a given, for example, for car accidents. Hmm? If you know, the chance of you having a car accident is basically independent of my chance of having a car accident, unless we all crash into each other or something, of course. But yeah, except for these really crazy circumstances, there's a sort of constant rate of car accidents that happen and individual characteristics maybe determine this a little bit, but there isn't like a wave of car accidents that 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 uh, that happens uh, in one year and there's like, I don't know, uh, five times as many car accidents as usual. Huh? That's very unlikely. So these individual probabilities are independent in the car accident example. And they have to be independent in order to uh, to get comp competitive, um, you know, and efficient insurance markets. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that they're in reality they're often common shocks. We are all living through one at the moment. Huh? The pandemic is obviously a common shock to healthcare systems everywhere. There's a reason that many, you know, many people are getting sick at the moment. Many insurance companies would incur a lot higher costs. If there are these kind of common shocks, insurance markets will not be able to absorb, uh, to absorb this, basically. Um, unemployment is another example. There is no private unemployment insurance. Why? Because this company wouldn't be able to, to pay out uh, the, the payouts in the case of the event occurring, because unemployment, of course, is correlated. Uh, the business cycle creates sort of correlated ups and downs of unemployment rates. So condition one, probabilities have to be independent is not given for things like health uh, insurance if you think about the pandemic and it's definitely not given for things like unemployment but might work well for cars for example what's condition two probabilities have to be less than one huh? uh, insurance only works with risk not with certainty you cannot insure for something that has already happened huh? if you have a chronic illness for example there can be no you know profitable health insurance provider that says, oh yeah, you know, just sign up and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Probability, you know, insurance, actuarially fair insurance or any kind of real life insurance, of course, only works by uh, having, you know, pooling the risk of things occurring rather than having people who already, where the, where the loss has already occurred, sort of signing up. The third condition for the existence of competitive and efficient insurance markets um, is that the probability has to be known or somewhat estimable. And this works well for the examples of sort of car insurance or health insurance for that matter, huh? that the probability of, of incurring sort of healthcare costs at a certain age, for example, is, is known and can be estimated. So is the chance of having a car accident. But things like inflation, for example, are really, really hard to forecast, and the probability of this is not, not clear. So it's not possible to insure against this, of course. The fourth criterion, of course, is the one we have already encountered, adverse selection. Insurance markets will not work well, will not be efficient if we have a lemons market type situation. Huh? Um, who is most likely to buy insurance? Well, the high risk types. So the premiums will get up, go up, so the insurance becomes less attractive for the low risk types, etc. You know the drill by now. Um, so adverse selection is basically one of the sort of key problems to, to, to functioning insurance markets. The fifth and final condition that has to be given for insurance markets to, to work is that there can be no moral hazard. Uh, but we, of course, know that there is or can be moral hazard in insurance uh, markets. So we've already talked about sort of moral hazard affecting the P term, uh, the probability of, of events occurring uh, with the idea of recklessness. Uh, and so, for example, for the car rental, that, that plays a big role. Uh, so, um, you know, the fact that it's a, it's a rental car changes your behavior. You're a bit more reckless with the, with the car. You leave it standing in an area where you wouldn't leave your normal car, for example, for fear of sort of it being burglarized or stolen or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so recklessness for the P term. Um, we can also think about healthcare examples. Huh? So, um, you, you know, if you, 
if you have good health insurance uh, or live in a place where this is publicly provided of good quality, you're more likely to, to go skiing, for example, than if you're you know, uninsured. OK. But moral hazard can unfortunately also affect the size of the loss. How does this work? Well, in many cases, basically, there's th sort of third party payment. Neither you nor the doctor who's treating you are the ones who incur the cost of the treatment, of course. Huh? So, you know, both you and your doctor have an incentive to order more diagnostics or to um, you know, choose the, the, the best sort of available treatment or the treatment that the doctor uh, thinks is, 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 is necessary or maybe pays him the most. Um, so uh, moral hazard can also affect the size of the loss if you have an insurance market. And this is essentially overconsumption, right? If these five conditions are not given, insurance markets will be inefficient. So that's a bit of a problem. So insurance markets will work well given certain conditions for certain types of risks, but insurance markets will fail completely for other types of risks we want to ensure. We have just seen the conditions under which insurance markets will not work well. Um, let's recap the adverse selection uh, kind of mechanism in health insurance a little bit. So let's assume there are two types of people, healthy people and sick people. Same as with the cars, basically. Good cars, bad cars, healthy people, unhealthy people, low risk types, high risk types. Um, and the insurance company offers, even if they offer actuarially fair insurance or something relatively close to it, what happens? Well, it's too expensive for the low risk types. Huh? Uh, the fact that there are the high risk types in it, the people who will incur sort of uh, high losses, you know, high healthcare costs makes it unattractive for the low risk types. So some of the low risk types will opt out uh, as it is simply too costly for them. What happens then? Well, the insurance, of course, has to raise the premium uh, for the remaining sort of pool, for the remaining pool of people. Uh, but that, of course, means that even fewer low risk types uh, are willing to buy insurance. Uh, which then in turn leads to even higher premiums and even fewer low risk types and so forth and so forth. And it basically unravels exactly as in the lemons example. And the consequence of this is basically that only sort of the high risk types end up buying very expensive insurance uh, and the low risk types are basically unable to 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 obtain insurance at reasonable uh, reasonable rates or it could be that insurance companies basically offer contracts that aren't complete uh, that that uh, that offer less than full insurance uh, for example by excluding pre-existing conditions etc and we've seen all these these tools for example in the us uh, in the us case of course and this, of course, is an example of a really important sort of market failure, mm -hmm. um, the missing market for, for health insurance if it is provided sort of in the, in the, in the free marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do we solve it? How can it be solved? Well, um, either through regulation or through public provision. So the regulation will take the form of sort of mandating uh, uh, insurance, right? It works for cars as well. So in the UK, everybody who has a who drive, wants to drive a car has to have health in, has to have car insurance as well. Um, but that could work for healthcare as well, together with with mandating uh, insurance providers to not turn away people uh, and not sort of exclude people for for pre-existing conditions, for example. So uh, a market that is very heavily regulated, of course, could work or a public provision and we basically tend to observe um you know public uh, insurance uh, publicly provided insurance for many of the things we want to ensure such as healthcare and unemployment and disability and things like that and this is probably one of the largest sort of roles and 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 expenditure items for the state so the core reason why University College Hospital is free to use for UK residents is basically a type of market failure. Huh? It's the inability of the market to provide uh, health insurance due to adverse selection, due to the lemons problem. Um, and Britain basically instituted the National Health Service, the NHS, after the Second World War, and it has stayed this way um, until now. But there are other reasons for state provided insurance that go beyond the adverse selection problem. And one example or one reason for this is uh, externalities, of course. 
public health externalities are this year sort of obvious to everyone. Huh? We don't want people to sort of avoid going to the doctor. We don't want people to avoid getting tested, for example. Huh? So making sure that everybody can get tested for the coronavirus, pe that people can get treatment, etc., have externalities, huh? have effects on other people. And that's one of the reasons we want to make sure that everybody is covered. Um, the other reason for why we want perhaps state-provided insurance has to do with efficiency. And this is also an interesting point of sort of pure economic theory as taught in Econ 101 versus sort of uh, empirical evidence and, um, and I think what we're trying to do here. Uh, so it's theory versus data. Huh? So uh, a naive view about efficiency might perhaps tell you that competitive markets are good for, for efficiency. Huh? And that is true, but in healthcare, it doesn't work this way. Um, and there's really good evidence uh, international comparative evidence uh, that basically public healthcare systems are actually more efficient. Why? Because they can reduce bureaucracy, reduce transaction costs compared to sort of these uh, insurance systems where there's a lot of insurance bureaucracy to process claims and payments, etc. And if we look at this sort of just, uh, you know, look, just looking at the spending data without sort of a good. Uh, empirical design, we can, however, still uh, already see what is going on here. Huh? Um, the United States, which famously is, you know, not covering all its population, um, is the country that spends the most as a share of GDP on healthcare. And actually, the US, of course, is a curious case as the single most expensive group, uh, elderly people huh, are actually covered through Medicare, covered as public spending. So the United States actually has high public and sort of high private spending um, and still sort of uninsured and, and sort of lack of lack of coverage. And the, all the efforts over the last years in terms of, um, you know, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, um, of course, are attempts to normalize this situation, sort of come to a system that is more closely resembles the other countries in this uh, in this graph, uh, other European countries, for example, in this graph. But the current situation also throws up an interesting uh, conundrum, an interesting problem that perhaps under this um, sort of drive to make this public service more and more efficient, more and more lean um, has been forgotten and we all now pay the price perhaps. And that is that there can be too much efficiency in a way in the healthcare system. Um, the pandemic shows the need for excess capacity. Healthcare systems are not like, you know, chain restaurants or, uh, you know, supermarkets. Um, extra capacity in terms of intensive care beds, extra capacity in terms of doctors, nurses, ventilators has been super crucial during the pandemic. Um, and basically healthcare systems need slack, need inefficiency, uh, what is apparent inefficiency to cope with high demand uh, in moments of crisis. Um, so. An interesting lesson from the pandemic, I think, is that yes, we should, you know, thrive to, to or try to to create sort of efficient healthcare systems, uh, but there's also value to redundancy and to 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 slack in the system to cope with extraordinary circumstances. So when you're back in your home country, so in charge of uh, healthcare systems many years from now, um, don't make them too lean, okay? And this is the end. Um, unfortunately, I cannot sing, uh, else I would have uh, tried to give you sort of a rendition of we didn't start the fire with the terminology from the class. Um, but maybe some of you can try. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground, uh, as you can see here on the right. Um, we talked about markets and market failures and public goods and externalities and market power and asymmetric information. Um, a lot of material, a lot of ideas, a lot of concepts. And in the beginning of the lecture, I said, I, I, I hope you learn some, some terms, uh, some, some, some lingo. Uh, and I think we've covered a lot of lingo. And I also said, I hope you learn some, some key concepts and some key problems. And I think we've, we've, uh, we've covered those. And so ideally you're thinking a little bit like an economist by now. And I hope you also take away from this that markets, you know, 
have some nice features, but they often don't do not work as advertised sort of by politicians or those who sort of fleetingly took Econ 101 20 years ago. Um, markets often fail. Uh, there are lots of problems. And ultimately, public policy, however, is about solutions. And so I hope you also learned about solutions to these problems. And I tried to cover some of these or many of these. And that's what public policy is essentially all about. It's about finding solutions to the problems uh, that, that we face. And so it's on, on, you know, up to you as sort of future public policy experts to remember those solutions or maybe be creative and think of even better solutions and uh, implement them and make you know, your countries and the world a better place. And when you add that, do stay in touch. Uh, shoot me an email. I'm always happy to hear from former students and see sort of what people are up to. Um, and maybe I can get you back to the class uh, if you if you if you work in one of these uh, in one of these topics and tell us about it. I also want to say that I really enjoyed making these videos, uh, and I hope it generated some interest in topics that you wouldn't normally um, sort of have counted among your most interesting uh, you know, topics. Um, so, uh, but that is it for me. Uh, after reading week, Thomas Gift takes over. Um, of course, I'm still uh, one of the seminar leaders, so it all continues. Um, but until then, it's goodbye from me.